Thank you very much for coming along this morning. Um, glad to see you at your coffee and so on. Um, so hopefully this uh, session will be good to get the day started. Um, you've got some caffeine kicking inside you, and so please do think about questions and comments as I go through. Um, I don't pretend to have all the answers, um, but uh, I have a passion for what we do in HR. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do this morning is to share some of that passion, some of those ideas with you. I started my HR career in 1986, so this is the 30th year uh, of working in HR. And I've had plenty of opportunities to do other things. The reason why I still do it is because I truly believe we can make a difference. <coughs> if I didn't believe that, like I'm sure the advice you would all give to people talking to you about their career development, I would have gone to do something else. Um, but I'm still doing it because I think we can make a difference and I'd like to tell you about it today. Um, I'm not going to give you lots of uh, models and, and techniques and so on. Uh, you know, we can all read about Ulrich, we can look at capabilities and competency models. What I'm going to do is just share with you some reflections from 30 years really to say what are the differentiators in my view between good and great HR um, and maybe leave you some thoughts um, to take away with you and, and reflect on. Um, when you leave here this morning. Just before I move into that, let me um, tell you about Hitachi. Quick show of hands, who once has, still has an Hitachi TV, CD player, DVD player, or some other piece of Hitachi technology in their house? Fantastic, thank you. So it's good to see a, a few hands go up. Um, Hitachi is a very old company. It started in Japan 106 years ago um, when a guy said, why do we keep on um, importing American technology? Why don't we make it ourselves? Uh, and the story has gone on from there. Um, what most people don't know is that it's one of the world's biggest companies. Uh, we have about 330,000 people in every country of the world. In Europe, our main products are in nuclear power, trains, construction machinery, financial services, data systems, and consulting. Um, but pretty much every sector you can think of is, is uh, an area where Hitachi competes. And we have a global challenge, which is really around talent. Traditionally, we've done a lot of our business in Japan. We're a huge, huge business in, in Japan, and about a quarter of a million of our people are actually based there. Um, the challenge we have is to become more global, and to become more global, we need more people and more businesses outside Japan. So we need to get our overseas revenue ratio to 50%, um, and uh, we're on track to do that. And in order to do that, we need a lot more people. Um, and we cannot continue to operate as a traditional Japanese company if we're going to be a global business. So if any of you work in international organizations, regardless of where they're based, I'm sure you may recognize some of that. Um, because traditionally, typically, organizations like to work in their comfort zone, which is the nationality of the company that they are. So we need to change. And there's a real movement towards globalization in Hitachi. But it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and that's why we need to ensure that HR is both effective and valued, which is the whole purpose of today's presentation, in order to deliver it. And so what I want to do is to cover these six areas um, in the time we have today. We have a little less time. I was told I had an hour. I haven't got an hour. So we're going to have to move through fairly quickly, because I do want to have um, five minutes at least for Q&A and, and for your comments and views before we wrap up um, later on. But Tim will keep us on track with time. <coughs> But um, we'll look at what the world thinks of HR um, to give us some context. And then point two is where I'll spend most of the time, really just giving you some reflections on what really makes the difference. Um, we'll talk about your team, um, you as the leader, um, summarize it, and then we'll have some questions afterwards. So that's what we're going to go through, uh, go through this morning. Let's start with the first of those, is, which is what does the world think of HR? You know, we don't live in a vacuum, do we? We live in a, in a context. Um, where people have different views of our organizations, they have different views of our functions. And, and I found working in HR that it is an area where people have very strong views. And uh, I, I've lost count of the number of people who have told me our HR function is completely useless. Um, I've heard that so many times, but thankfully, of course, they, they say to me, I'll just thank for yours obviously isn't. Um, the challenge is we want to be in that isn't rather than that is box. But there was an article uh, a few years ago now, but it's a, a very, um, sobering article in Fast Company magazine called Why We Hate HR. I just want to read a part of it to you, see what you think. After close to 20 years of hopeful rhetoric about becoming strategic partners with a seat at the table where the business decisions that matter are made, most human resources professionals aren't nearly there. They have no seat at the table um, and the room is locked inside a conference room 
Um, so the table is locked inside a conference room to which they have no key. HR people are, for the most practical purposes, neither strategic nor leaders. The human resources trade long ago proved itself, at best, a necessary evil, and at worst, a dark um, bureaucratic force that blindly enforces nonsensical rules, resists creativity, and impedes constructive change. So, that was an article, uh, and if you Google it online, you'll, you'll find lots of feedback, lots of other comments that followed on, on, on from it. So it's an ongoing debate. But haven't you heard some of those messages before? That's the global context in which we work. It is not neutral, um, and, and there are very strong views. So I think we need to understand that when we think about how we, how we create effectiveness and value. We also need to understand what our organizations expect of us. Um, and uh, the, the broader commercial context. This is just uh, one, one slide from a recent survey which asked CEOs what do they want from HR. Um, and um, you can see some of the areas in which they want HR to focus. Um, you'll recognize some of those, I'm sure, from your own organizations. Something we did a few years ago um, was to look inside Itachi and actually say, if we're truly going to become global, what do we need to do differently? And, and what does the organization want from us? Um, and we did a survey. We asked uh, a, lot of our, a lot of our people, so across 180 of our companies and 4,000 HR people, um, we said, how do you spend your time? And this is what they told us. So just over half of the time of our HR staff is spent on administration. Now, on that previous slide, how, much of, how, how many of those um, bars said administration? Uh, of course, we recognize immediately there's a disconnect between what we do very often and what our organizations want from us. Um, obviously, there is some strategic work in there, consultative work, which is great, um, but it's not enough. We also asked the HR staff, um, how do you spend your time? And this is, this is what they told us. Um, so about half of the time is general affairs administration, recruiting, and employee relations. And if you go to the very bottom, you can see strategy, communications, OD, HR information, talent management are all less than 3%. Um, so almost the opposite of what we've just seen from the, the CEO slide. We also asked our business leaders, what do you think um, in terms of HR's performance and in terms of what you really want from HR? And then we, we mapped it, and again, this is just one slide, which shows the difference between their satisfaction in the dark blue um, and the importance of that area in the, in the light green. And you can see the disconnect, and of course, this is just the worst slide, many of other parts of it were not so, not so extreme, but you can see the gap um, between the expectation and the requirement and, and the delivery. Now this is a global picture, this doesn't um, focus on particular teams, but it's the global picture of the view within the organization. So again, it sets the context. We do not operate in a vacuum, um, and we need to recognize what our organization thinks of us. And I guess the question for you as we, as we um, move through this is actually, if your organization was to do that with you and your team, what would the results say? You know, what do they want from you? Um, and if they were to score you in terms of satisfaction with you and your team and what they deliver and what they think is really important, how would it look? Um, and, and then, of course, the most important question for us is, what are we going to do about it? We asked one of our CEOs, <coughs> is a guy who runs our, our global rail business now. Um, he's, a, he's a Brit, um, the first non-Japanese to run one of our major organizations outside Japan. Uh, and um, this is what he said to us at a presentation he gave at our global HR conference a couple of years ago in Tokyo. Um, and again, what do he want from us? He wants us to look at talent. He wants us to look at culture, globalization, performance, um, attraction, development. So the sort of areas which we didn't see on the activity chart where we're focusing our time, but it's what the business wants. So. If it was easy, we would be doing it, and we'd actually have alignment between those bars, wouldn't we? In, not just in my organization, but in yours too. Um, but of course, it isn't easy, and part of the reason it isn't is because we live in a VUCA world. And increasingly, I hear people talk about VUCA, and I think it's a fantastic way of summar summarizing the, um, uh, the, the type of world we live in, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And isn't that true of HR? I mean, whilst it's a, it's a military term originally, isn't it true of HR? 
that actually it's very difficult to predict. It's very difficult to know what's happening next commercially within our organization, with our people, um, and more broadly in the environments where we work. So um, it, is, it is a VUCA world. So in a sense, as HR leaders, we can say, well, you know, is there actually anything which we can hang on to? Are there any principles that apply? Um, any learning that we can share that can truly make a difference in this type of, this type of world in which we leave, uh, live and in which we lead? And um, of course, the answer, I, I believe, is yes. But it's not, a, not an easy thing to do. So let me move into what I think are seven key areas where we need to focus, um, which are the differentiators. Um, to, to, to ensure that we have great HR uh, within that global context that we talked about. Now, the first one um, is paraphrasing what this guy said. Now, back in 1992, when Bill Clinton was a, a Democratic nominee for the presidency of the United States, um, a guy called James Carville was one of, his, one of his team, and he coined the phrase, it's the economy, stupid, when really focusing people on what's really important. And um, paraphrasing that, I think, for us in HR, I think it is that. It's the business, isn't it? It's the organization, I guess, depending what sort of business or organization we work in, typically it is the business, which is the core of what we do. And I think in terms of the key area where we need to focus, above all, it is in the business in which we operate. So that we understand as HR leaders, as HR professionals, what action must we take so that our organization's people capability can deliver its business goals? And we can't do that without understanding the business. Um, you know, we talk a lot about being business partners, um, being critical of our function, in my observation. We tend to be much better at the partnership bit, because that's the bit where we feel more comfortable, than we feel with the business part of that. So in other words, as um, HR professionals, if we're truly to be valued and effective, we have to be able to speak the language of the business. We have to understand the P&L. We have to understand the balance sheet, the customers, the commercial pressures that we're under. And again, I'll ask you a question. If you were asked this afternoon to give a presentation explaining um, the, uh, the, the, the current P&L of your organization and the current commercial pressures um, and the key priorities, could you do it? Um, and if you couldn't do it, um, I believe there's, there's a gap there and something you could consider in terms of ensuring you are, are able to do that. Because unless we are able to articulate the business in which we operate, we will always be seen in the way of that fast company article at the beginning, which is somewhere separate, not in the room where the decisions are made. Because the decisions are made in business language. Business leaders talk numbers all the time. And then we come in and talk our HR jargon. And if we want to keep talking HR jargon, in my view, we will never be at the table. We have to speak the language of the business, and to do that, we have to understand the business. Um, I, was, I was talking to an HR director um, a while ago who said to me, look, if I really wanted to talk the business, I'd have become an accountant. Um, I disagree with the view, of course. Um, somebody else said to me, she's a, a student at university who's studying for an HR qualification. Um, and she said to me, Every time I apply for a job in HR, when I have to do the numerical reasoning test, I fail it because I just can't do numbers. Now, that raises a very interesting question in my view, which is actually, is the future of HR about people like that, or do we have to have a level of, of numeracy and capability with numbers if we're truly to be credible? Um, raises a question for us. I, I don't think any of us necessarily have the, all, all the answers, but we do have to know the businesses, customers, market, strategy, P&L, and speak their language. So in terms of where we start, for me, that's absolutely crucial. Good HR people can do it, average ones can't. Second thing we need to do, um, and the second sort of uh, reflection, if you like, um, on what make, makes a difference, is that we need to focus externally. Um, now clearly, we talked about the context, we know there's an ever-changing external world, that VUCA world in which we live. Um, and I believe that it is the role of HR to take that external world and bring it into our organizations and interpret it and make it something meaningful. Because if we don't do it, who is going to do it? Um, HR has the capability, the knowledge, the network, these type of sessions. You know, fantastic way of sharing, understanding what's going on um, out there. Because we, and we have to bring it in to our organizations. 
there's so much going on. You know, here, this is um, a mega trend survey that the CIPD ran a few years ago, and these were some of their conclusions. You know, we all know this stuff. We hear about it all the time. Demographic change. You know, about 30% of our, of our population now are over 50 years of age. Um, decline of collectivism. You know, the, the number of trade union members has halved over the last 35 years. They're massive change, and we could go through that. We could spend all day talking about these things. We need to understand them and think, what do they mean for us within our own organization? There are many other trends, too, um, out there. Uh, and this is just one list I found online, just to give an example, really. Um, I read something last year that 4.2 million of us in the UK work from home some of the time. Um, again, isn't that a massive change in flexibility? It certainly wasn't happening when I started in HR, because you didn't have the technology. And so what are we doing in HR to ensure that our organizations have the technology and, the, and are able to facilitate these changes? Many of them, of course, are, are um, uh, millennial changes, millennial um, trends that we're seeing coming through. And um, by 2025, 75% of our workforce will be millennials. So that's only nine years' time. What are we doing about it? Because those, as we all know, Millennials want some different things from the way maybe we traditionally operated um, in our organizations. Um, and so these are massive trends, and they affect all of us. This is a, um, a report I came across when I was uh, looking at some, some um, issues around millennials. Um, even the United States uh, president uh, discusses it. This is a report to, to uh, President Obama in 2014 on 15 economic facts about millennials. And that's what they are. We're not going to go through them. but the point I want to, to really leave with you around this is that we have to look externally, we have to understand it, and we have to say, what does it mean for us? Because we can't escape it. And if we're going to truly add value, we need to be on top of it. The third area um, where I would suggest we need to focus to add value is change. You know, every organization in that VUCA world has to be able to change and has to be able to change effectively. And I believe that HR staff are uniquely equipped to manage change because we understand people, we understand organizations, and we understand change processes. Um, so we need to make a difference in that area. Now, I show this slide. It, was by a, uh, it comes from a guy called Andy Grove. Um, he died recently, actually, but he used to be the CEO of Intel. And he wrote a book called Only the Paranoid Survive, um, which says unless we're paranoid about the competition, eventually our organization will die. And he talks about the inflection point, the point that organizations come across um, from time to time, it could be every week, every month, every year, where they have a chance to change. And either they change and thrive, or they decline and die. Um, and from our point of view in HR, I think the challenge is how do we help our organizations to both identify those points and then do something about it? Now, we all know it's easier to do nothing. And if we do nothing, um, Andy Grove would argue, we simply accept the status quo and decline. So HR, I believe, truly can make a difference um, and truly can impact the organization and create value if we understand change and if we're able to um, help the organization go through a change process. So we need to be the champions of change, the architects of change in our organization. Um, the reason why it's so important, well, this guy, um, this familiar face can articulate it far better than me. I came across a quote of his, which is paraphrased and written on the wall of the bar of all places at the Institute of Marketing um, out in Cookham in Berkshire. Um, and it broadly says that, if you keep doing what you're doing, you'll keep getting what you're getting. So we know that change is important because if, if we don't change, then we basically keep getting what we're getting and our organizations are going to decline. Fourth area where I'd suggest we can truly differentiate ourselves is around um, organization culture. Now, Tim mentioned it's an area he's, he's working in. You know, there are people out there who can, who can focus on these areas and provide expertise because it is so important. Um, and again, I would argue that HR is uniquely positioned to understand culture and be able to manage culture in an organization. Um, and clearly, as, as um, uh, you can see on the slide here, there are many benefits of having a thriving, vibrant culture. Um, I think sometimes culture is seen as being a bit soft and woolly, so it kind of sits with HR because it's soft and woolly. In my view, it's a business imperative, um, having the right culture that supports the direction of the organization. So it actually isn't a soft, woolly kind of HR thing over there somewhere. It's fundamental to the organization. And if we just think of a, some, some, some great brands, I mean, at the beginning, um, Tim mentioned Apple. 
I mentioned Google, I think about Virgin. You know, you could talk about some great brands. Immediately you talk about those brands. Doesn't that make you think about the, the, the workplace? Doesn't that make you think about um, the, the, uh, uh, the opportunities um, and the way they might manage their staff? And um, they, have a, they have fabulous reputation out there. Like, take Google as an example. Um, their, their guy who heads up HR, uh, Laszlo Bock, wrote a book. Was it last year, year before? Um, talking about work, it's called Work Rules. Uh, and it's some great ideas about what they do in Google and how it can apply to others. So brand is absolutely fundamental. And with that comes culture. Um, because if the culture isn't aligned, then clearly they're not going to be able to continue to, to thrive as they are, nor indeed are we. Um, and it, there was a Deloitte report that came out recently which said that leadership drives culture, which drives results. So it isn't about soft, woolly, HR, fluffy stuff. It's about leadership, culture, and results. So that's why I believe it's so important and we have to be in the middle of that. Um, because if we don't do that, if we don't, if we don't ensure that it thrives, then ignoring the health of your culture is like getting the, letting the aquarium water get dirty. Now I don't keep fish, but I imagine that if you do that, your fish don't survive very long, or at least are not very healthy. Um, so if we want healthy organisations, um, we need to ensure that we don't ignore the health of our culture. Just um, looking at uh, one practical way that we've done that in uh, Hitachi. We have a, a fabulous rail business. If you, if you ride on high speed one at all between London and the Channel Tunnel, you'll go on our trains, the Javelin trains. If you watch, if I've got news for you on a Friday night, there's a, there's a cartoon at the beginning with a picture of a blue train. That's, that's a picture of our train. And shortly our trains will be running on um, Great Western and East Coast Main Line replacing those very old intercity 125s. We have to, you know, have to open the window and lean out to open the door. I mean, this is 2016, and we still have to do that. So um, fabulous trains, fabulous business. Um, and, and we've grown very quickly from, from nothing to a, a business with, with um, uh, four billion pound plus um, of, of uh, orders within about 10 years. And we took the Hitachi values, which are these. These are, these are translations from the Japanese um, of the Hitachi values, harmony, sincerity, and pioneering spirit, and worked with the, the team there in the rail company to say, what does this mean for you? you know, let's take these overall headlines for our culture, um, which have defined our culture for 100 years, and translate them into something which is meaningful for you in your rail company, in your context, in your country, in your market today. Um, and this is what they, what they came up with. There's obviously a lot more behind it. But I think it's a practical example of where HR can help shape culture um, and, and give some tools and techniques to do that. Um, I think the other thing I want to say before we leave culture um, is that culture and strategy there's, there are always linked. Um, and clearly, when we talk about one, we have to think about the other. Um, there was a, a CEO of a FTSE 200 company who wrote a book a couple of years ago who, that said, uh, forget strategy, get results, and just focusing on how culture can drive an organization rather than strategy. Um, in Stanford University uh, in the US, they ran a, a, a lecture course called um, Does uh, Culture Trump Strategy? And this, and this picture, that, that culture eats strategy for breakfast, which is the, the term that we've heard many times, um, is, um, I, I think is very powerful. Again, in my view, in HR, we can truly differentiate by being between the culture and the strategy and understanding both and linking both together. Because while strategies come and go, and haven't we all seen that? Strategies come for two, three, four years, and then there's another CEO or, a, or another change, and we have a new strategy. Cultures tend to stay for, for years, for decades, but they have to shift. They still have to change. They have to be adapted to the environment in which we're working today. Um, and again, HR have a place to play in that. So, in my view, it isn't about culture or strategy, it's about culture and strategy, and we in HR have to link the two. Um, Winston Churchill once said, um, sometimes, uh, however beautiful the strategy, you have to look at the results, um, which I think is a very good quote, uh, and um, I wouldn't like to be the person that received that, uh, uh, that challenge from him. But I think we all understand that, that we need to move from strategy and, and, and deliver results. And if we don't do that, then we're never going to have credibility and we're never going to be valued. Um, so the delivery of results is, is fundamental to what we need to do. 
And that, of course, includes some of those administrative areas, some of those basics that we talked about at the beginning, which is perhaps not where we're going to add massive value in one sense, but unless we get them right, we are never going to be invited to do all the other stuff. So um, I think in terms of um, the, the key differentiators, we have to have a focus on delivery, because if we don't deliver, then we're always trying to catch up. We're trying to rectify the problems, um, and we're never able to have a platform of strength from which to move forward. Um, having said that, I, I think we do need to um, have the humility to accept when we've made mistakes and do something about it. Um, but we do need to focus on delivery. Going back to Laszlo Bock, the guy from Google, um, he, he, he wrote something around, I'm always striving for nirvana, always trying to find that better way of delivering what we need to deliver to our businesses, learning from what we did last time, always improving, so we have that foundation of delivery. Sixth area, um, I think, which is differ differentiating for us, is about relationship development. Now, that's something typically in HR we do well, I think, across the piece, because HR people often work in our function because they, they, they have those, those people skills. Um, having said that, I'm sure we've all seen situations where they haven't, but certainly where we're, where we're changing, where we're trying to create a, an agenda of, of transformation in our organizations, the whole focus of engagement is, is key. And it, that's an area where we spent a lot of time um, working in Hitachi, looking at how we can develop relationships and connections with our, our businesses. We have very um, autonomous organizations. They don't change by mandate because we cannot mandate within our organization. We have to persuade, encourage, recommend, and demonstrate um, value through, uh, through the relationships that we have. And there's no doubt that human nature says people like to work with people they like. And we have to develop those relationships and our teams have to develop those relationships um, in order to be valued and again give us the platform on which to do um, other things. Um, and I think in doing that it comes back to speaking the business as well. You know, Having those conversations shouldn't be our agenda but should be the business's agenda and having that credibility and developing that credibility by being able to develop a relationship, talking about what's important to the business, not what's important to us. Um, uh, it, it reminds me of a quote by Dale Carnegie. He wrote the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Very old book, great quote, which says you can win more friends in two months by being interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get them interested in you. Um, but how often as HR do we try to get people interested in us rather than starting with where, with where they are. And seventh and final um, differentiator for creating a valued and effective HR function is focusing on finance. Um, again, sometimes it's a little bit counterintuitive because um, we're all a cost, we're all an overhead um, of some description within our organizations, depending on how, they, how your organizations work. Um, but we have to remember, again, that our businesses will speak finance all the time. And therefore, we have to be able to do that and demonstrate what we're doing in terms of financial benefits as well um, as some of the softer areas. So that's back to metrics. It's about analytics, um, areas where I think that very often they're emerging with our organizations. But I think for the future, we have to be get much better at it um, so we're able to demonstrate financial benefits. Again, a practical example in Hitachi, um, we have been looking at how we can improve our HR processes and practices, going back to some of the feedback at the beginning. Um, and we've looked at our providers of employee benefits um, and, and uh, other areas where our many different autonomous companies have gone to the market separately and bought HR-related um, items, very often benefits. And by working together, of course, it, doesn't, it won't surprise you to, to, to hear we've saved a lot of money. So we've demonstrated actually a return by, by actually working collaboratively, networking more strongly, but also showing HR can take a lead in order to take out cost in the business. Um, and of course, cost savings in an area like benefits can give people the, as good or better benefits than they had at a lower price for the, to the organization and hence more profit. And isn't that a great way to recommend what we do? So let me tell you a little more about um, our transformation in HR. So this is what we're trying to do. I'm going back five, six years now um, to move from the triangle to the diamond. And I'm sure you've all seen that before, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But that, that's our challenge. So through outsourcing and, and um, automation, get that, uh, that, that shape changed. 
and again, I'm not going to, going to dwell on this, but we have a plan to say we want to move towards best-in-class HR, um, future-focused, and by doing that, implement a range of technologies that we've never had before in Itachi. Um, and um, some of those are on here. So Taleo for recruitment, Workday for our HR system, uh, Cornerstone for our learning management system, uh, integrate them all together um, with Workday and Cornerstone being the key to that. So for the first time, we're demonstrating to the business an added value approach around the way we manage people, data, the way that we deliver HR services. Um, demonstrating in that VUCA world, we're responding to the challenges um, and addressing the issues that they raised with us that I showed you at the, uh, at the beginning. And let me just tell you a few things about what we've achieved. There's a, there's a long journey and, and far more than I can talk about this morning. But I just really want to demonstrate maybe some of the successes that we've had that, that show that some of the focus um, areas I've talked about can truly make a difference in the organization. So we've implemented a new performance management system. We've got, we've got companies to buy into it. We've got 100,000 people working on it. For the first time, we've implemented a consistent grading system within um, Hitachi. Previously, we've run very many different systems depending on which part of the world or which part of the business they were in. We've introduced the same one, and we've got 50,000 positions graded. Um, and we've got um, 250,000 people on our database. We've advertised 3,000 jobs so far on our career site, on our Taleo's career site, and got a talent pool of 90,000 people. We've run a, a, an employee survey to demonstrate some information back to the business, not locally, but globally. Uh, we had 152,000 people participate uh, and a 78% participation rate. Um, and that employee benefits point I mentioned to you, um, globally so far we've taken out about $5 million. Now that's all, five, that's all profit, $5 million profit made by HR. So a way of demonstrating the financial benefit of what we do. So that's about the business and that's about um, some of the differentiators. I'd just like to talk about a couple, of, a couple more things. Um, the first is about your team. Just have one slide on this. Um, what about our people? Uh, because clearly, we can't deliver all this ourselves. This is something that we're involved with, but inevitably, um, we need people um, to make it effective. I've just got a few thoughts in terms, again, of what um, I've learned um, and uh, what I think has made the difference in the areas where I've been operating. I think the first point, uh, and maybe this won't surprise you at all, is, is, is I always hire for attitude. Because, of course, you can't train attitude. People either have it or they don't. And if they don't have the right attitude, the right approach, um, uh, the sort of can-do approach, you're never going to get it. And, and um, in my view, you should never compromise. You should never hire them. I think the second point is never to underestimate the importance of emo emotional intelligence. Now, we need bright people, numerical people in HR, but clearly the emotional intelligence, the ability to develop those relationships, recognize what's important, to manage themselves and their interactions effectively, um, is hugely valuable. And a, and a quote, um, which again is in Laszlo Bock's book, but it's an old quote, which says, always hire people who are better than you. Um, we need people around us uh, who, who understand technology better than we might do, certainly better than I would do. Um, they understand um, leading edge thinking in their own particular area of, of the HR profession better than I can do. Because without them, I'm not going to be able to, to future-proof my organization to succeed in the future. And then, and then I just put this, this um, as I was thinking about this slide, I just put this little equation in there, which says if you take attitude and multiply it by EQ and then by capability, you get achievement. And they're multiplied, of course, because if any one of those is low, the whole thing's low. It isn't just a case of adding them up, and if one's low, the rest looks OK. I, in my view, if you don't have the right attitude and the right EQ, emotional intelligence, um, with the capability, you won't have a, a successful HR function. And, and um, if I was to pick two, I'd always pick the first two. Of course, we can train capability um, to do a job. We can train the skills, but what we can't do is train attitude, and nor can we give people emotional intelligence if they don't have it. We can develop it, we can improve it, but we can't um, give them the fundamentals of it, in my view. So that's the, that, those are my reflections on the team. What about us as HR leaders? What about us um, as, as HR professionals? Um, I guess my challenge for you this morning is to, to look in the mirror um, and to answer this question. Why should anybody be led by you? 
Um, there was an article about this in the Harvard Business Review um, a while ago. You may have seen it. Isn't that a great question? Um, and doesn't it make you feel slightly scared when you think about it? Um, and I'm not going to ask you to answer it. You'll be pleased to know. But I think it does challenge each of us to say, actually, you know, we need great people around us. But why, why would they follow you or me? Um, what is it we contribute? What is it we have um, that allows us to um, truly uh, demonstrate our value as a leader and, and our contribution and bring people with us? Because if they don't come with us, we're not going to be able to, be able to succeed. So when we think about that question, I think there's a second question that goes with it, of course, which is actually, OK, this is, this is why I think people should be led by me. But actually, what my organization needs from me is more than that. And what am I going to do about it? Now, the fact you're all here today, clearly you are wanting to do something in terms of learning, in terms of development. This is a developmental program, um, a couple of days where you have a chance to get out of the, 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 the office and do some different things and think and, and network and learn, uh, which is fantastic. But I do think, as HR leaders, if we, if we stand still, if we think we've got it all right, if we think we've cracked it, then we absolutely certainly haven't. Um, and uh, we need to ensure that we answer those questions, not just today, but um, as time goes on as well. So let me summarize. I've just got a couple of minutes left. So let me just summarize um, what I've said in terms of the differentiators, really. So 10 points um, that I've, I've talked about um, through this morning session. What we have to do to build an effective and valued HR function, first of all, we have to be able to know the business and speak the language. If we can't, we will never be at that table uh, and able to, to truly be um, part of the business leadership. We need to know what's going on outside our organisation in the wider context and bring it in. Because if we don't do it, no one's going to do it as effectively. We need to be a change agent. We have to understand change and we have to be able to help our organisations to change and recognise when they need to. Uh, we need to be champions of our culture, both in terms of understanding the culture um, and developing our culture and ensuring it's linked to the strategy and both support the other. Uh, absolutely fundamental is we have to deliver results. If we don't deliver, then like any other business leader, we won't be able to um, get into other areas and we won't be able to, to become truly valued and effective. Uh, the sixth, I think, is we have to build great relationships with key stakeholders absolutely fundamental um, and that's why emotional intelligence is so important. Um, anybody see that film Jerry Maguire with Tom Cruise? Um, there's a great line from that, show me the money. Um, if you've not seen the movie, um, take a look. Show me the money. You know, we have to recognise we operate in a commercial world and therefore from an HR point of view we need to think about finance and financial benefits when we're thinking about how we communicate to the business and how we can add value wherever it is we're, we're operating. Um, I think it, the, the eighth uh, lesson, the, the, for me, the eighth um, uh, point I wanted to give to you this morning is we should hire people that can do those seven things. Because if we're not doing that, we're not hiring people that are better than us. We're not able to improve the gene pool of HR to uh, ensure that we're able to be successful in the future. And of course, we have to develop our teams so they can do those things too. And finally, we need to look in the mirror and we need to answer questions. Um, that, I, that I showed earlier on. So I think that those are, for me, the fundamentals. Those are my reflections um, on, on building an effective and valued HR function. Um, I just want to leave you with a couple of quotes um, because I think we should wrap up with people that uh, are far wiser than me and can actually say things um, uh, in, in a way which um, I, I think perhaps are, are, are much more valuable. This is just a picture of one of our Hitachi trains in, in Paddington. Um, and I want to leave you with a quote, first of all, um, which comes from Jim Collins, who wrote the book Good to Great. Um, and, and I think the, the reason I want to leave this quote with you is because our CEOs typically will always say, people are our greatest asset. Haven't you heard that so many times? But actually, I think it's our, our role in HR to, to ensure that becomes a reality. Because it's easy to say, it's extremely hard to do. Um, but it's our expertise and our knowledge um, that allows our organizations to ensure that um, that can truly be um, effective because great vision without great people is irrelevant. In the end, our success um, as, as whatever sort of business we're in will depend on our people. Um, and it doesn't matter what we do, um, but it's going to be people who are going to uh, ultimately deliver success. 
So it, it's fine for organisations to have vision, but in the end, it's people that, that make the difference. And we are the people. HR is, is the function which understands that and which has the skills and has the capability and has the training and the knowledge to do something with it um, and make it um, a, a reality. So I think, great quote, great challenge for us. And finally, um, I'd like to leave you with a, a quote I came across um, from Stephen Covey. Now, he wrote the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Great book, again. Um, and to really answer the question, you know, why have a passion for change? Why have a passion to create a, a different organization in the future, to embrace those challenges we've been through this morning? Um, because it's one of the hardest things we can do. You know, it's far easier not to do it, isn't it? And that's why most people don't. Truly um, creating a valued and effective HR function takes a lot of work, takes us out of our comfort zone, um, and means that we are challenged um, and stretched in ways that otherwise we would never be. But Stephen Covey said this. He said that we should live, we should love, we should laugh, and we should leave a legacy. Now, each of us may or may not do enough of those first three words, but I'd like to leave you with the thought that truly creating a value-adding HR function which is effective and creating an organisation that is successful for the long term is a legacy that we can all leave if we're willing to rise to the challenge. Thank you very much. So we are on track with five minutes to go for your questions, comments, reflections um, on what it is I've said this morning. We have a microphone, don't we? Shall, are you happy to oh, run around, Tim? Fine. The microphone. You just no, you're going to talk loudly. But, um, just first of all, thanks for a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Good, thank you. Super cool. Thank you. Oh, is it? Sorry. Um, sorry. So great. Um, we are going through much the same thing and have been doing for several years. When we talk about the business partners and we talk about what they're doing today and what the business wants them to do, one of our greatest challenges is technology. Or US, the US being more or less homogenous, has a lot of technology. Mm. Or US is a whole different ballgame. And often because of our, the levels of recruitment, you know, and the size of the HR teams, they're actually doing soup to nuts. So did you find that? And how did you overcome it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 is, it is truly difficult to do. And, and I, I take your point about the US. Um, I've worked in US companies, and um, part, I think part of our role, part of my role in those companies, and indeed in the Japanese companies, to, is to help them understand how it works here, because we don't have the same currency, language, legal framework, and, and so on and so, and so forth. Um, but inevitably, yes, you, we, we do have um, the HR staff who do soup to nuts. So they have to do all those, all those things. Um, I, I've, the, the approach I've taken is to, is to try to find the best of the people that, de, 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 regardless of which area they're working in in my team, to say, okay, how can we develop you and your, and your business partnering skills? You may not be in a business partner front-facing role, but actually how can we take you and use those skills? So developing the skill and the individual, rather than just saying I've got a business partnering team here but they're doing so many different things, they haven't got time to, to do it. It's almost broadening the scope of business partnering and saying it doesn't matter what you do, which function you're in, how can you actually develop those skills and, 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 and add value. I think the, 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 the second challenge um, that we have is, is what do you do when people don't get it and can't do it? Because regardless of how broad the role is, there are some people that can't um, and I think, I think the challenge that we face as HR for the future is what are we going to do with those people and how do we help them? Because the expectation of, of, of HR today and the businesses today, as, as, you're, as you're intimating, is, is so different from what it was. Um, and um, we, have to, we have to find a way to be able to move our people around. So there is, there is no easy answer to the question, I think. Um, but it's, if, if it was, I'd be a multimillionaire writing books. Um, but it's, it, it's, I think it's an area where um, uh, we just have to find some pragmatic solutions to keep moving, moving the organisation on. Because when we stop, that's when we're going to have an issue. Thanks for your question. Great question. Stephen, hello. I'm Sarah Salter. I'm the HR Director at Northumbrian Water. We are really pleased to have your new factory at our... Yes. ...in Bishop Auckland. No, I showed a picture of it. That was on the yeah. previous slide. Absolutely. So, really pleased to have that in the region. And for, for sure, you are recruiting for Attitude there. Mm. 
we, we, we have some visibility of that, that's brilliant. What are you doing about the rest of your managers and leaders in other organisations where you're not starting on a greenfield site? Mm. How do you bring the people that you have forward with you in the culture, the attitudes and behaviours that you are as an organisation working towards? Yes, and that is a really, really tough thing to do actually because we have so many people in so many different organisations and different sectors. Um, and some have been around for, for, for years and years, um, and particularly those that have come from Japan where they still have a job for life um, approach, they've only ever worked in Hitachi, so they haven't seen the broader context and the other, maybe other organisations as, as most of us have. Um, the, 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 the way I, I try to characterise it is to say that, I mean, everybody in HR has to have an absolute passion for developing relationships and, um, and influencing individuals to change. Because we can't mandate change, um, and we're not setting up, as you say, as we are in the, in the new factory where we're actually really focusing on our attitude before skills, um, we absolutely have to have a, a tireless passion um, for, for change. And, and um, you know, there are two capabilities that in, in HR that perhaps aren't always highly valued, which are tenacity and resilience and actually recognizing that we must have people that have those capabilities because individuals won't change quickly. We know how hard it is to get people to change. Therefore, we have to be, recognize we're in a long-term change program. Some things you could do quickly, some things you can't. I think the other quick thing I'd say, because we're just running out of time, um, is that in the end, you have to take an 80-20 approach and say, if people will come with you and demonstrate what's possible, I'd much rather spend time with them demonstrating to others the art of the possible than, than spending a huge amount of time on those who are stuck where they were and have been for years. And so in the end, I think you have to focus on, on those who will change. And then ultimately others, you have to believe, will come along too. Thank you. Do we have time for one more, Tim? One more. Make contacts you get when people... Hi, Steve. Uh, Dave Sabo from Lubrizon. Uh, Steve, this may be uh, getting into the weeds type question, I'm not sure, but it's in relation to your show me the money comment. Uh, I wonder how that played out with your senior leadership team in respect of implementing some of the technology that you shared with us that you are implementing, in particular uh, the LMS, because that's uh, uh, dear to my heart at the moment. Right, yes. Um, they're, they're very supportive, very supportive of it. Um, the, the challenge we have actually isn't quite as obvious as, as, it, as it might be. Um, and that is, and, and similar to the, the, the global point we, we, we talked to about a moment ago, is that we had a local LMS, um, great system, very much tailored to Europe. We now, have a, we now have a global LMS. Inevitably, the more global you get, the, the, the less specific it is, the more kind of vanilla it is, and therefore it less, it, less it delivers uh, that's specific to the business that you're in. So I, I had to talk to our business leaders and explain the globalization and the new system. And then they said, hang on a second, Steve. Just explain to me, why are we taking out a system that works for us and putting in something that doesn't work as well for us? <coughs> so, so actually, the price of globalization often is losing what, what you need and what, what they need um, for their specific business or an, and a degree of compromise. So, so um, they're very supportive of the technology. I think, I think there's the element of, well, OK, we'll give this a go. You know, we'll see what it delivers. Um, and we're very, at the very early stages with Workday right now, but, but it's going really well. Um, so I, I think they're open to it and recognizing it's the right thing to do. Um, but there are some concerns about, another challenge I had was about self-service, was are you putting in Workday so that we do all the work for you and you can take out some HR cost and so on. So there are challenges around it, but I, 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 my, my belief from what I've seen of Workday and, and Cornerstone, and, I, and I've already worked with Taleo for a few years now, is they're fabulous systems in the end they will convince people it's the right thing to do. And as, as all of us live our lives now on technology, you know, why wouldn't we live our working lives on technology as well? So, so I've seen so far there is an open door. Ask me in a year's time. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. That was, uh, I'm just trying to uh, the, the, express what I'm feeling. I think challenge, honesty, and just straight talking all the way through the presentation. I've taken an awful lot away from that, and I know by the there the were more questions that we had time for. So um, a really great session to start the day. Steve, thank you great. very much indeed. Thank, thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.